Okay, good evening everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome our brilliant Yvonne Barton from the Italian branch, um, also brilliant website editor for the whole society. Um, uh, she inspired by Olivia Filippi, Beth Chatto, and also the Mediterranean Garden Society. Um, she was lucky enough to find that before starting her garden, um, has built an irrigation free garden in Umbria, which several of our We've had several branch visits to it and also international um, members have also visited. Um, tonight she's addressing uh, the subject of climate change, which we've just been discussing. It's something that's concerning all of us, um, particularly with reference to the, the Lago Tresimeno area of Umbria, which is in central Italy. However, I think that she has a very interesting um, perspective on how we can also calm ourselves in the face of these uncertainties and how we can try and get more out of our gardens in every season of the year and you know obviously trying to mitigate the effects of this climate change to understand what it is and how how much it's going to to, to impact us but uh, it's I'm sure we're going to benefit enormously from her sharp and intelligent mind and her uh, great focus on this subject. So we'll all be muted for this duration. There's going to be the presentation and we'll have questions and answers at the end of the season. So I will ask you now at the end of the session, I beg your pardon. Um, thank you, Yvonne, you're a hero. And um, if you'd like to share your screen with us now, thank you. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, firstly, can I just ask, are you seeing my, my screen properly? Yes, it's perfect. Oh, it okay, and, and you can hear me clearly? Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, well, look, um, the, the talk this evening is really a reflection which consolidates various ideas that we've been uh, able to savour during this last two years of, of wonderful talks that have um, come about through adversity, through the, Zoom, the, the, the need to meet through Zoom. And um, every talk we've had has brought some, something to, some food for thought. And the question that I've started to ask myself in all this is, we always seem to talk about summer talk about summer droughts, we talk about lack of rain in summer, how do we uh, cope with our irrigation in the summer. But the experiences we've had in the, the recent past here, at least in Italy, are that the problems with our coping in summer actually tend to be rooted in winter. So I'd like to just spend a little bit of time talking to you about how I view winter, and why it's important, and why in fact we ought to appreciate it more. Um, and on this opening uh, cover here, we have um, on the right-hand side, this is a the rather iconic vision of my garden, which is essentially a, a natural uh, pool um, with uh, olive groves uh, planted in with Mediterranean macchia plants. And there the, the, uh, the water lilies steal the show. In the winter, the water lilies have disappeared down and they're having their, their well-earned sleep. And all around, we have the forms of the same plants, which we appreciate even more if we get snow. Not that we get snow that often, but when we do. Um, so let me just say what I'd like to do is first of all, just say a few words in favor of winter, why it's underrated. <laughs> and are we seeing a change in, in the way winter arrives and, and, and how it affects us? And particularly in, in the area that I know here in Lake Trasimena. And does this mean that we should not water the garden? Does this mean that we should look at the, the, the watering challenge differently? And why should we be even more vigilant about pesticides and fertilizers on our gardens? Why does this matter? And if so, what are we going to do about it? 
but I don't want to get too bogged down in any one of these issues because I would like for the first time ever on screen without a safety net to show you some real plants. And um, so at the end, I'd like to spend a few minutes just showing you what's in bloom this afternoon here in, in my little garden. And um, I hope we can share. Okay. Right, just to introduce where, where I am at the moment, speaking to you from um, an area known as Colli del Trasimeno. Uh, my place is at 435 meters above sea level, and we look onto Lake Trasimeno. And as you can see in the photograph there, um, the lake, the big lake is, um, the surface of it is at about 250. So it, we don't feel like we're as high as this, but we, we, it does mean that we get cold winters occasionally. In the win winter, we would go, we plan for eight, and we expect that to be when the rain comes. But of course, it doesn't always. And sometimes we have snow. And this is what prepares us for the summer, where we expect there to be anything around 40 degrees uh, Celsius, and we plan for there to be no rain. The soil here is essentially stones with a bit of clay uh, wrapped around them. And if you look at the map in the corner here, you can see we are um, smack in the middle of Italy. We're due north of Rome, about 100 miles north of Rome, and uh, about as far from the coast as you can get in, in Italy. Now, in the summer, um, we, we like to talk about the, you know, the hot, dry summer, drought, um, how do we cope with drought? What about, every, you know, how do we have a, um, a, a, the dry garden in summer? And this is where our Mediterranean gardening conversations normally focus. Actually, most of what is on in our gardens that we celebrate so much is usually in, in what is described as spring. So, you know, um, April, May, June. So, but the real hot summer in uh, August and September, we do occasionally get uh, summer storms, but the water that arrives in isn't quite so useful because it tends to, tends to just run off and, and go straight into the, into the river or the sea. So we're always talking about drought in summer, but if it's always hot and dry in summer, is it really a drought or is it just summer? So, what we do need to think a bit more clearly about then is winter. Because winter is when we expect the rain to come. Winter is when we expect our plants to regenerate. They go into repose. They, they, um, most Mediterranean plants are actually asleep in summer, but they also have a little bit of a doze in winter too. But they, they regenerate. Um, all that rain, maybe snow. Snow is great because it, it delivers a lot of water slowly. We can, we can use this time to appreciate more slowly, more, more at a gentle pace, what is going on in our garden. The light is at a, 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 a more oblique angle, so we're not having to deal with the intense overhead beating sun that we, we often shelter from. We can actually get out there and really appreciate what's going on in our garden. It's a time for planning, because we can see the bones of our garden more uh, clearly exposed. We can plan, we can plant, and it's the best time for planting. And we can take small delights in little features in the garden and the different tones of colours that are special to that time of year. So let's think about this then. Winter, strictly speaking, is from late December to late March. It should be, it can be wet, dry, we can have snow, it can be warm, it can be freezing, it can be windy. Um, but whatever we get, it controls the growing season in the following spring. So it matters. Now, how we define winter, of course, can be a matter of taste. I mean, in, in, there are some uh, garden designers like Tarcisio Barrison, an Italian uh, um, professional. And he says, of course, in a temperate climate like England, we only have three seasons, which is autumn, winter and spring. We don't actually have summer. And I don't know if you recall Jem Hanbury talking to us from Western Australia recently. He said that the Aboriginals recognise six seasons. Now, here in Central Italy, I, I think we could do with the fifth season in sort of in between spring, early and summer, you know, late spring, early summer, because 
we don't doesn't give us enough definition really to, to say it's all spring right through to the end of June. Anyway, I leave you with that to think about. But winter does matter, and we should appreciate it. Now, the, the pond I was showing you a moment ago, it has different moods, different times in the winter cycle, which I think are all different and, and fascinating. And in fact, this picture on the on the left here, you can see um, on a, on a clear uh, winter's day, the, the blue sky reflected in the water. And then out on the horizon here is Lake Trasimeno in the same, um, also shining blue. Uh, here in, in this uh, top picture, we've had an air frost, which is always very dramatic. And um, the, the, the ice coats every single little twig and, and blade of grass. And um, we get a magical, um, suspended, almost like a, a breath of winter that's gone through the, the garden. Um, and we see here we've had a little bit of snow in sorry in, in this bottom right hand corner. Uh, and again, we we appreciate the forms and the reflections and um, the water is in the pond is frozen solid. So um, uh, we we the, the shape of water is different. Anyway, not everybody has a pond, but. Everybody, I bet, has had a difficult part of their garden. And this is my first challenge. I've called it the rubble garden because this is what it is. And it's where I started in the garden. Now, top left here, you can see this is the my rubble garden in May. And this area in the upper half of the picture is exactly that. It is a, a mound of a huge great heap of builder's rubble from when our house was first um, reno modernized, renovated, what do you want to call it, in the 1960s. Um, when we came here uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was still exactly that, a heap of rubble. You know, uh, concrete, uh, bits of concrete, reinforcing bars, gone rusty, half bricks, you name it. You couldn't get a spade in it. And, and it was hideous. Um, the area at the front here, where the Santolinas and the other uh, lower growing plants are, was the bonfire where they uh, burnt all of the uh, prunings from the olives. And so it was just a heap, huge area of black all the time. So something had to be done. And I tottered down to our uh, local friendly um, uh, garden center, uh, people who I've, I've got to know very well over the years. And I discovered that they had in the back of one of their polytunnels, a whole load of little teeny weeny plants growing from cuttings in tiny little, what they call forest style, little uh, sample pots, little square um, pots, no bigger than that. And they were all local macchia plants. The cistuses of different types, Ceanothus, Teucrium, uh, rosemaries of different types. So I just got a, a, a boot load of those, came back and squeezed the little tiny root balls in between the bits of rusting iron bar and half bricks and so on, and stood back. And this is what resulted. And the area of the of the of the bonfire is now all of the sort of Santolina, uh, uh, Bellota, Helichrysum type plants, just planted in a random mix, and kept as a you know fairly trimmed. And um, and there's no sign of the bonfire anymore. So that's in May. This bottom left hand corner is in uh, late January, early February. So it's not exactly the same, but it's it's not so it's it's not so unattractive. We've got um, coronella, rosemary. You notice how the cistuses. This is quite a tall cistus. I think it's Ladanifa. The buds, the the the. It's not actually started to to grow properly yet, but the but the the the, the terminal leaf clusters have turned a bronze color. And on the right here, this larger picture. This is on the first of March because this is the day when the almond blossom always comes out. And you can see here again, you know, we've got all of the fam favorite uh, macchia plants, um, maybe not quite as rich in color in, in the range of color, but still given that this is the middle of winter, it's a, a, a fairly um, comforting um, range of, of, of planting. And I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind Pete Outdorf's 
uh, observation that when we're in winter, that brown is also a color. And we shouldn't be always hankering for the more primary colors, that we should content ourselves with um, more, more restful um, color palettes. And the light, and the light is so much more kind and the angle of the light brings out uh, features which we would never really think to look for in summer. And this is where the pond is rather good with its reflections. But even if you don't have a water surface like that, um, grasses become um, almost fireworks when they're, they're touched by the light. Um, this is a, a arbutus, which has both flowers and fruit at the same time, looking really rather magical. And this is a, a, a loquat, the leaves we suddenly appreciate, because they're rather dull, drab leaves in, in, in the summertime. But it, touched by the winter sun, they become a much more ethereal and fascinating form. Oops, sorry. And, and we see other fascinating forms, the, the, uh, the dried heads of Achillea, um, they lack the, the, the intense yellow of their summer colouring, but they still have a, an interesting shape that, that we can enjoy. The um, ever-present uh, Trachylus um, jasminoides, um, or star jasmine, in winter the, 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 the foliage takes on this red, red tinge, and we suddenly start to appreciate the form of its branches and the shape of its leaves, which in the summer we don't bother to even think about because it's just a dull sort of a you know glossy dark green, and it's the flowers and the perfume that we're really interested in. So it has its second chance to um, fascinate us, and we shouldn't always even be looking just at flowers. The the, the fruit on um, um, the, the uh, uh, Gutoni aster and the um, different berries like um, uh, uh, pyracantha are, are very attractive and, and give punctuation marks through the garden uh, at this dark time of year. It's also when we're out there busy, we're doing pruning, we're pruning our grasses, we're pruning our roses, but we're planting and um, we, we, we um, we get any any nice bright sunny dry day and we get out there and we get to work in a way that would be um, just too exhausting in the heat of summer and of course the plants wouldn't thank us for it. Now I, I rather wanted to show you here in my live uh, plant display um, some of the flowers that, that we get here and but we're just a, about a week or two early I'm sorry about this that we would by the end of January, beginning of February, we've normally got um, Iris reticulata, which is up here on the right, um, Crocus, this is Thomasinianus, and this is a, a particular favourite of mine, this is the Seabury uh, Crocus uh, trifolata. Um, I have got to show you, though, some um, of our um, Algerian iris that always seems to come right through the winter, so... That's good. But, so, but we, you know, the, the colour intensity of these little charming bulbs is wonderful. Um, not many Italians really bother with bulbs. It's a shame because they're so, so delightful. And there are other flowers that we have in, in February. Um, I can't show you yet the hellebores, they're still on their way. Or at least I've got a hellebore, but um, um, they're not really quite with us yet. This one on the right here is the Corsican hellebore, which is very similar to one which is native to this area, it grows on the edge of the, of the, of the, of the woodland. We should still see, see soon also uh, wild violets, which I enjoy enormously at this time of year, but regret when um, the rest of the year they become a weed and they infestate everything. So, <laughs> um, and Tucrium, the weed of the Mediterranean, um, is with us right through the winter. It's flowering now. And, you know, this is, this is just a gift. Um, also, the, a lot of, the, the, lot of the, uh, design principles that we've carefully put in place when we've been looking for our summer garden. So we've been looking to, you know, put down gravel as mulch and to design to maintain um, uh, maintain moisture and to uh, give the plants the best um, way of coping with the drought. 
actually it still looks good in the winter it's not it's not a wasted effort it's no need to to take a different approach in in this particular regard the gravel garden is still looking pretty good the shapes are still there the the, the skeleton of this is, is is robust this is what it was like in in may june sorry june um not so different delightful but in a different way and those silver leaf plants that we have find are so useful in summer so drought resistant they light up in the in the garden in winter when when the the, the sunlight touches them and uh, here on the left, we've got various helichrysums, flomis, of course, the olive trees uh, in, as a design feature. And, and here we've got um, Caterniastolacteus in little huge uh, clumps, which um, give a structure to the garden in winter with a touch of red. And the roses, if you've chosen the right roses, and I would suggest to you that um, anything that is a China rose or the first derivative of a China rose, is most likely to succeed. They, they seem to be most capable of, of dealing with um, lack of water in the in high summer. They have this wonderful um, ability to repeat right through winter. Okay, maybe not in the same uh, bountiful display that they would have in, in, in the spring or the autumn, but they're still very welcome. And because they're so such rare touches of, of glamour, we appreciate them all the more. And here on this is this is um, um, Zephyrine Druhan uh, on the right here. Normally it's a fountain of flowers, but even in this more sparsely um, um, populated uh, time of year, when the, when, the, when the sun comes round this corner of the house and, and picks up the, the blossom, isn't that lovely? So much to be appreciated. And this bee here in, in February um, two years ago was, was delight, delighted to find this old blush climber um, awaiting him. Um, so I think it's uh, there's plenty to, to, to like about even roses in winter. Um, it's not a patch on the China roses in, in autumn, I know this, but who can't have everything. Now, let's just say something about winter rain. Um, normally, we expect to get um, a, a very important contribution to our rainfall and that allows the plants to uh, regenerate and, and to fill up the, the underground resources, the aquifers. This is a winter phenomenon. And as you see on this graph, the, the orange bars are what we'd expect to get on an average year, so averaging it over the past 20 years of rainfall. My neighbor, Ian Robertson, very kindly um, measures all of the, uh, the rainfall for me and um, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm indebted to his record. Um, we normally expect to see um, a considerable amount of rain in November, December, and, Gen and then continuing around down through January, February, and March. Uh, maybe in the form of snow. Um, the year just gone, we only got half the amount of rain we expected in the first six months of the year. And, you know, that's, that's particularly bad. If you look at January, we got almost nothing. May, not only did we have almost no rain, we also had temperatures up in the 30s. Um, it was very, very hot. And, and this was um, very damaging, not just for the gardener, but for the, uh, for the farmer. Now, you, you're wondering what on earth happened in September. Well, in September, in the space of 36 hours, we got more rain than we'd had in the entire year up to that point. I mean, it was just amazing and devastating. Uh, and was there any use to us? Well, I'm afraid it wasn't. It just washed away. And I think we have to start asking ourselves, you know, what well, is this winter uh, dry period something that is going to be the norm? And does that mean that we are, ought to be out there watering our gardens in winter rather than worrying about the summer? Because if the garden doesn't regenerate in winter, no amount of rain in, in, at odd moments in the summer is going to help us through. Strictly speaking, 2022 had total rainfall that was exactly the average. But we know that in fact, that at the times of year when it was most useful, 
uh, in other words, when we expect it to just keep going and, and you know, soaking in and, and replenishing the aquifers, uh, we, we got very much uh, uh, less than we should have done. Um, and I think this is, this is something that we have to think about. And, 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 and the effects are visible. Now, this is Lake Trasimeno, seen in early winter um, two years ago. And you can see it's quite a big lake. It's quite a big expanse of water there. In fact, the, the lake is about 20 kilometers in diameter and it's very shallow. And no rivers flow in or flow out from this lake. So what it means is that the lake is, is like a sort of a crucible, a petri dish that shows you exactly what's going on in, in the climate because there, there are no external influences. If, if the rain doesn't fall, the lake dries up. And it has done this several times over the cycles of climate that have occurred throughout uh, the last few thousand years. And because it's an important water uh, resource, um, people have always taken note of it. And so we have uh, historical um, observations on the lake from two and a half thousand years. Um, even in two, the year 217 BC, Hannibal, when he arrived in, in Italy and confronted the, the Roman army, he defeated the um, uh, consul Flaminius by surprising the, um, uh, the, the, the army and forcing them into the, the water, the, the, the marshland, which is in an area, I mean, we know exactly where all this happened, and it's in a place which now is, is, a, is a town. It's way above the lake. And so we, we know from his account exactly how high the water was in you know, 200 years BC. And, and so right through history, we, we, we know what's been going on. So 2022, was it an exceptional year? I think it was. This is the same, essentially the same view as I showed you a moment ago. And look, that this horrible great um, expanse of dried up um, land that's, that's appeared. It's well, it became known locally as the beach, and it is exactly that. Um, wasn't only uh, in central Italy though. This is also uh, um, we've had uh, very dry years in, in sorry, very dry winters recently in, in in Umbria, but in the north of Italy, this came as a bit of a shock. They had no rain. Um, uh, right through um, the uh, right through winter, and what happened was um, the the, the po this is the River Po, and this is this is a massive watercourse normally, and you can see that great areas have, have been have just dried up, and there's just a trickle, this meandering stream running through, and there's a bridge which would normally be spanning uh, a great river, and. This is in, in March, so there's been no rain right through the winter. And um, there's a number of things that happen as a, as a, as a result of this. The first one is that um, because there isn't this volume of, of fresh water pouring out into the, um, the, the mouth of the river where it comes into the sea, the salt water from the Adriatic started to move upstream. And so by March, we'd already got a, an incursion of salt water 30 kilometers upstream. And this is just devastating for uh, agriculture, um, freshwater fishing, um, shipping, uh, boats can't go up and down the river. You may not realize this, but a lot of power stations are located on rivers like this because they need the water to cool the, um, the, the, the turbines, the, 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 the process cycle of, of, a, of a power station needs a lot of water. And so we found that not only had there been um, many power stations not able to operate, but also hydroelectric dams couldn't run because there just wasn't enough water to, to, to feed them. And so about 10% of the, the nation's power generation was offline. I don't need to remind you what was happening in the energy world in March 2022, the tanks had rolled into uh, Ukraine and we were in entering a period of energy crisis. So this was very bad news. Um, the reaction had been really quite hysterical from some uh, institutions. 
um, uh, a state uh, institute said that it was the worst drought for 500 years. I think that's going a bit far, actually. But, um, but essentially, there was no rain in the Po Valley for more than 100 days. And uh, this continued to be really bad right through into June. And eventually, the salt water had reached 40 kilometers upstream. So this is pretty bad. And this is what it looks like on the map. This is the, the monitoring um, by the European Drought Observatory of um, essentially uh, areas of crisis. The, the, the bright red is where the, 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 we're really short of, um, uh, we were in severe drought. As you can see, the Po Valley up here is in a terrible state. And as are we here in central Italy. So what happened to Trasimeno? Well, uh, you can see on this map that the this is the, you know, the beach here and the sediment um, and the whole thing just drying up. It's very clear from satellite imagery. And uh, we um, it's not the first time it's happened. Far from it. This photograph on the left here is in 1957. And the one on the right is the same place in uh, 2022. So it's, it's becoming an issue. And you know, how do we manage the water resources to, 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 to essentially save this lake? Because it's, it's such a, a big um, um, influence on, on the local economy and tourism and just essentially our, 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 our communal well-being. It also means that because there's less water, the um, amounts of effluent and pesticides in the water are concentrated. And we have to also look to the local farmers to, for some of this to blame because you know, crops like tobacco and hazelnuts, which of course, you know, they're, they're growing enormous numbers of now for Ferrero Rocher um, chocolates. Um, it all uses enormous amounts of water. And of course, there's all of the uh, treatments they put on the crops that roll into the lake. Um, what can we do about it? Well, when they had um, a, a, a very serious drought exactly 200 years ago, um, they tackled the problem by um, marathon prayer sessions. And by praying for 72 hours without a break, they felt that they were going to get somewhere and get a, a response to, to break the drought. But essentially, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, lack of rain and very high temperatures continued right through summer and into October. And the reason they knew without thermometers that it was above 30 degrees, even in October, it was because the cicadas were still scratching, which they only do at a certain temperature. And so, they, the, the, or as they say in Italian, the, the, the cicadas were singing right through into October. But the, the, the prayer was effective. And in the end, it, it, it all came right because in November it started to rain and it didn't stop. It, it rained every single day right through to the end of May, even including snow. So here's an idea. <laughs> but like I say, this is 200 years ago and it, the lake has seen um, it, uh, very large variations in level. Um, at, the at that time, the lake was about two meters higher than it is today because it, they, it was towards the end of the Little Ice Age in, in, in Europe, where the temperature was a good couple of degrees cooler than it is now, um, on, a, on a natural cycle. And um, we, we've seen sometimes, this is 1957, you see the, the level of the lake. This is that picture I just showed you a moment ago within black and white. Um, the lake got into a, a real crisis. Um, and that was sorted out by um, civil engineers, people like me, and but was skidding back into this crisis again. And so our local water company is, is about to construct a pipeline bringing water in from a dam up in the mountains beyond Perugia. It's so important that we, we do something to, to save this crisis. So how did we get through the year? Well, we had... Um, uh, very little rain, as I was saying, up until September. That September flood, although it was massive, was not enough to make any real impression on the lake. Um, and there's lots of engineering reasons why that was. But look, you see these boats tied up by the quayside? This is after the floods, and they're, they're still looking pretty sad. We had no rain at all in October. Uh, we've had some in November, 
and December, but now we're into, guess what, dry January. Are we repeating ourselves? I have a feeling we are. So what worries me is not the summer rain, because I think we can cope with that as long as we get the winter rain. I also get worried, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but I, I would just say in passing that we've had terribly strong southerly winds in the summer coming from, from North Africa, which to the extent that they make it worse, they, they, they dry everything out, you see. And we're going to be having more mild winters perhaps, but maybe with just the odd cold snap that just catches us out. And I don't know, I, an elderly lady in, the, in our village once said to me, you know, there was a time when we used to have normal weather. I'd like a bit of that actually. So what, what's this got to do with us? What, what's, where does gardening come into this? Well, we can, in our own little way, reduce water usage. Uh, we can at least not use treated potable water. And we can reduce fertilizers, which cause nitrate runoff. And we can uh, stop using pesticides, weed killers. And we can encourage wildlife and conserve flor native flora. What's not to like about that? And this is what we're up against. This is, this is the, the, the lake full of algae, if it weren't bad enough, uh, being full of sound. The algal um, buildup is exacerbated in hot weather and uh, particularly with nitrates from, from fertilizer running off into the water. And what happens is, it, is that the um, algae uh, reduces the oxygen in the water and bacteria grows and, and it kills the fish. And, Quite often we see when it's like this, uh, shoals of fish just floating dead on the water surface. It's pretty disgusting actually. So we've just got to stop putting nitrates into the, the lake. And you can see it, this is, this is, the, this is the aerial shot of um, Dresimeno in, in August last year and it's bright emerald green. And that is apparently, they say, is a, a sign that it's a lot of um, these um, chemicals. So we, we just need to be out there doing stuff to make it easier for the, the, the wildlife and the flora to, to get by without it just destroying everything. And if we're having warm winters, we expect the um, insects to be out and about uh, more often, particularly bees being out on the wing early in the season. Now, I'm, I have to say that this, this photograph made it all worthwhile for me. This is a bee visiting my um, uh, uh, um, winter flowering honeysuckle in February last year. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that make you glad to be alive and growing stuff? And um, of course, you can go too far. We, we had a, a massive swarm of, of bees in, in, in May and um, I was told it was my own fault for having so many flowers. Oh, thanks, okay. Um, anyway, but the, 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 they took the, 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 the swarm away. Um, flowers blossom, not just flowers in your garden, but also your um, uh, agricultural blossom. Olives, we have a saying here that, you know, if you have, um, roughly translated, if, if, if the olives bl bloom in April, then you can take away, you take the olive oil away in a barrel. If it's in, if they flower in May, is there's enough for everyone to have a, have a share. And if they flower in June, you take the olives away in your, in a handful. And essentially it's the, the temperature and the water built, uh, the water resources that were available to the trees um, that let the trees set the fruit properly. And otherwise the blossom just drops to the ground. And that's what happened to us this year in, in May when it was 30 odd degrees and no, no rain. And in, in our uh, land, we just lost all of the blossom, not a single, um, not a single root. So, I mean, I'm not going to bash on about this because it's the, one of the fundamental tenets of the Mediterranean Garden Society. We need to look to cultivate uh, in a way that is um, sympathetic to our environment and captures spirit of place, which is not done by just watering everything um, willy-nilly in a, in a, to get an English style garden. We need to be sympathetic to what is right for our location. Now, and I'm not saying you should be doing this on your vegetable plot and 
plants in pots, they need all the help you can give them. So you know, just, just to mention that. Um, I probably don't need to tell you how much water a lawn takes. I hope nobody on this call has got a lawn. Shame on you if you have. Shame on you particularly if you water it. Angela, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but no, I mean we need to think about what what have we got? You know, we we at the end of all this, when you watered your lawn, what is it? It's just a patch of grass. Now I I know we're supposed to use grey water, and I have to admit here I I tried using washing up liquid, but washing up bowl water on plants last this last summer. And it didn't seem to do any good. They just died. And I just wonder if our washing up water is a bit too grey. <laughs> it just, um, just didn't seem to be the right thing. Um, but no, I mean, I think we all know in the Mediterranean Garden Society that um, if we look to the uh, plants that are in the countryside that surround our garden, we can instantly see what kind of planting will be successful for us. And in, in where, where I am in Central Italy, we're talking about the, the, the Macchia, the Macchia Maremma. Um, but wherever you are in the world, there will be a, a, a particular type of, of local uh, um, flora that is self-sustaining and tolerant of, of everything that the local environment throws at it. Here is the track at the end of our garden. This is how you come into the property. And on this little bit here, this is, this is essentially a waste ground that nobody does anything to it. It's just, you know, nobody loves it. It's just, it's just there and like Topsy, it grows. And on that little bit, you can find all of these plants that I've listed here. Everything, I mean, there's two types of cistus, there's florist, broom, arbutus, dog roses, flag, anyway, it goes on and on. We, I do worry though that in that little patch we have some nice um, wildflowers which are under threat from being killed off by um, the uh, best intentions of our local council who go around with weed killer or people who just um, pull stuff up or um, are, are, are uncaring and so I, I, I worry that things like the gladiolus, the orchids um, simple things like Chentranthus and, and the uh, white cistuses are, are under threat, and so I, I grow them in great as numbers as great as I can in the garden. I'm too late though for the lizard orchid that used to grow at the end of the track there, and that's I think that's gone for good now. Uh, maybe it wasn't killed by weed killer, maybe somebody dug it up, but one way or another, I can't show you a picture of it because it's there no more. It's, in the end, obviously, all of you will know how your local conditions are and what you, what kind of plants you need to, to put in there. And as Beth Chatto told us right at the very beginning of the emergence of this philosophy of gardening, we want the right plant in the right place. And I would just remind us to be a little bit courageous in when we're doing this, because there are some plants which have defense systems which make them not quite as attractive in the summer, but they, they do survive. And you may think, oh, that, that Sisters Purpureus up on the top left there is looking pretty sick. No, it's not. That's just a hot day in summer. And come September, after that rain, the, the, the leaves un, uncurl, and there it is, perfectly happy. There was nothing wrong with it. And if I'd gone up and scratched the, the, the stem of that plant, you would have seen that the green sap was flowing. It wasn't, it wasn't dead at all. Similarly, this flomis here in the middle, this fruticosa, it curls up its leaves. It's just a way of coping. Now, okay, maybe you don't like the look of that, but best if you don't like the look of a plant that does this and to put it further away. You don't have to see it too much. You, you can just appreciate it, the bright flowers when it's in, in bloom. Uh, some plants dive down completely. Gorse, and you think, why are you planting gorse? Um, because actually, gorse is a really nice flower in winter. Um, the gorse drop burned off completely. I'm left with a skeleton. But in fact, looking more carefully, it's popped up somewhere else. It, it, it survives by um, evasive tactics and sending up runners underneath the ground. So we need to be a little bit more um, self-confident. In, in what we what we plant, not to be put off if it curls up a little bit. 
And here's a very good example of spirea. You don't think of spirea as being a particularly um, tough macchia plant, but look, there it was in April, April, 2017 was another year in central Italy where we had almost no winter rain at all. Um, in August, look at it, that's terrible. October, back as if nothing had happened. Now, you might say, I don't want to put up with that brown mass. Okay, fair enough. Um, but just think about maybe you would design your planting scheme that you wouldn't have to look at it, but in, and appreciate more its spring flowers and find a way around the problem. But you know, don't don't banish spirea just because it goes brown in the summer. Sometimes uh, I don't really know what to do, and this is this is a conundrum. Rosia banksia, Rosa banksia lutea. It's a very very common plant. I'm sure you've all got one. Um, uh, it's magnificent. Look at this in, in, in April last year. In November, it was flowering again. So what's going to happen come April? I, I have no idea. And um, OK, I, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of the principles that we, we already adhere to in, in the MGS and in things like planting in, in autumn and, and through winter. Particularly, I would say that small plants grown locally from cuttings, ideally, in square pots, it really is a key to success. But it does mean also, though, that if we're not going to get any winter rains, that we need to check the plants carefully and make sure they're, they're watered deeply um, occasionally to, to, to get them established before the, the heat of summer arrives. And, and you can't always find the plants you want in autumn. And a lot of plant uh, uh, garden centers only stock up in the spring. So, okay, but just don't, don't go planting after the end of March. Keep that plant in a pot and keep it going until the autumn. Because, you know, even if you do look, it's very difficult to see from this picture, but in the foreground are some cystuses I planted in, in April this, this year. For, for, it was inevitable, I couldn't know anything about it, but they were tiny little plants, about this big and teeny little pot. And I watered them once and they came right through the summer, fine. And then now, but so big. Um, there were some other plants which were a bit bigger in what you might call normal sized pots, round ones, round circular pots, which I put in behind and they just crisp up and I planted them like, uh, planted them as carefully as I could, um, watered them like crazy. Mm -mm. They just couldn't go. And, and I, I just, it just really underlines as it, it wasn't an experiment I really wanted to have to do, but it does reinforce that, you know, small plant, square pot, um, and not after the first of April, if you can help it. And, and this, this and I, I know you probably all, all really all know this, but you know, the difference between a square pot and a round pot is, is enormously important to the, to the way the, the roots develop. And when we water, we should water um, not very often, once every two weeks, maybe, and put an awful lot of water on so that we're mimicking the, the, um, the, the Mediterranean style uh, summer storm. But if you keep them, a, a plant wet when it, 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 it right through the, the summer, there's a, a, quite a probability that it will just die because it's got diseases, fungal diseases, things like that. And you know that you get uh, sappy growth, and their, 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 their life span will be very short. And uh, we should let the um, Mediterranean plant estivate, have its summer sleep. I think using hard landscaping features is very valuable. Uh, dry stone walls, things like that. Uh, the most successful of my roses have been where they've been able to put their roots underneath a massive stone. This is a huge boulder. Um, it's about four, 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 five foot across and two or three feet high. Um, um, but you know, in the end, if we're not getting the proper rainfall pattern, plants are going to die. And if they are going to die, I would strongly recommend that we plant a variety of plants together so that if you lose one, you don't notice so much. Um, if you're going to have a, a monoculture, and, I, and 
if you, a, a lot of people around here plant hedges made of Portuguese laurel and they've all suffered terribly. Every single one has a gap in it at the moment. And it's partly like a rain. It's also um, uh, diseases. There's a particular disease that's attacking this Portuguese laurel and all over the place. It's, it's looking pretty sad. If you have a mixed hedge, and look, there's so many plants to choose from. This is the um, botanical dry garden by Mates in uh, Grosseto, where they have a show garden showing you all the different plants you can use for topiary and hedging. And there's, in that picture alone, there's 20 different varieties. I mean, if one of those got taken out by disease or, or, or it just couldn't cope, you wouldn't notice because you, your eye is drawn to all of the others. And if you do, it's got one of the same thing all everywhere, then you're just inviting pests and diseases, you know, box blight. And you get so much more interesting uh, planting schemes. Um, pruning, I know everybody likes trimming everything to an inch of its life and topiary and fine. I'm, I'm not like that, but I don't hold it against people. But I do object to this mutilation of trees. And this is a very popular thing in, in, in Italy uh, where they just hack mature trees to bits for no, for no discernible reason. Um, why not have a tree that is appropriate to its space, that is native to the area and therefore will grow beautifully and we can rejoice in its natural form. I have lost one or two shrubs this year because I've been tempted to prune or trim them heavily at a time when there was either a heavy frost on its way or when the, the rain didn't arrive, so they weren't able to regenerate. So I think, you know, if you're going to trim, look at the weather forecast. And another plea, just to be a little less tidy. I rather like my path through the garden full of weeds. A little weed. I was br brought up on the programme Bill and Ben, so I'm, I have a sympathy for weed. Anyway, I'm not going to read all this out. Um, I just want to say this. If when we're looking at winter, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? It's a time for us to reflect and to hope. And uh, Shelley, when he wrote the Ode to the West Wing, was in fact um, in sitting in a, uh, a, a woodland park in Florence, just down the road from here, um, almost exactly 200 years ago. Spring in my garden, when it's looking good. Late spring, this is my fifth season, when the, the range of plants is different and summer, when it's hot and intense and we enjoy our um, hot colors in the garden. Now, in bloom, have I got time to do in bloom now? I'll do this quickly because I know I've been talking for a very long time. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Now then, can you see, first of all, this is, um, we have, the first rose is Zephyrine Drua, which is a Bourbon, where it's um, essentially it's a China uh, hy um, hybridized, but very, very vigorous and manages beautifully without any irrigation. Um, she's also accompanied by, not quite so uh, flashy at this time of year, but a very beautiful form, but this is, this is Lady Hillingdon, and um, Lady Hillingdon is just a cascade of these um, honey-coloured blooms at the moment. In summer, the, 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 the perfume of Lady Hillingdon is, is, it is liquid, it's honey on the, on, on the air. Um, we've got, um, uh, oh, there is, there is a hellebore, just one. There he is. Welcome, hellebore. I can't tell you what it is because the hellebores tend to crossbreed. I don't know what they get up to when I'm not looking, but, but anyway, you, you can't <laughs> you can't guarantee what they're, they're going to turn out like. Um, the Algerian iris, which I think is just such an exotic, wonderful thing, and it really is from Algeria. I've seen these growing like weeds by the side of the road in 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 Algiers. Um, um, so exotic, and it's just a, a wildflower in this part of the world, and totally um, resistant to drought. Um, the first of the anemone coronaria are coming through. Um, these I allow to seed everywhere. 
and yes they are like a weed i don't care they're in mixed colors uh, just rivers of them everywhere but they are a native flower to this part of the world obviously i'm the ones i've planted are, are, are you know, we've been um we've had a college education that, that more more sophisticated but the um but they, they are local to to this part of the world and the uh lavender dentata as long as the frost isn't too severe um this, this should just about pull through uh, and it's in flower right now and i never know whether to prune it or not I any if it, i don't know if anybody knows what to do about that um, lavender. So, what else do we have? Um, I've got proper flowers. Oh, I'll, before I go any further, before I forget, we the first of the euphorbias is coming through. This is euphorbia rigida, as you can see. It's, it, yeah, and, and, and it, he's he's embarrassingly uh, wrapped up in, in tin foil because he leaks um, a, a rather nasty latex. Um, but um, uh, a, a very acid colour, but very welcome, I think, uh, at this dark time of year. Now, what else do we, we have? We, oh, we've got some boring plants, terribly boring, but so welcome. So this is viburnum. This is a, um, uh, a special viburnum. It's called e Eve Price. And Eve flowers a little bit earlier and uh, slightly larger flowers as well. Um, so, you know, OK. Um, boring. I mean, it's it's a native viburnum is native to this part of the world. Um, why not make the most of it? Um, we've got uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, winter flowering jasmine. Again, you think, oh, boring. But you know, in 1846, when Fortune brought this back from Yunnan province, um, first presented it to the gardening world. It must have been quite magical, something that blooms like this in January. I mean, what's not to like? Well, if you don't like yellow, of course, then I'm afraid really, that's a bit of a, a setback. But you know, we've got more, more. What have I got here? I've got Coronella glauca, which okay, it's yellow and it seeds itself everywhere, but it's but it's cheerful and grows on the edge of, of uh, woodland very nicely. I've seen in, when we were in the south of France for the, for the AGM, they had this growing through um, uh, um, one of the famous uh, gardens there, which I'll remember the name of sometime. And we've got um, my favorite, favorite um, uh, winter flowering honeysuckle. So beloved by bees, um, it grows very well from cuttings. If anybody wants some, you see the the little white flowers on that. It's a very big shrub. It's it grows about three meters high. Um, we've got um, flowering right through the winter. We have uh, tucrim, and everybody's oh, not that it, you know, it just gets out of hand. It's everywhere. Um, well, okay, ordinary tucrim fruitycans. This is. This is this one. It's a bit insipid, but well, you know, it's very useful for, for filling big spaces and, you know, it's very, it's almost impossible to kill. This is the Fruticans uh, um, Azoreum, which has a lovely, deep, rich um, flower. And it's not quite as robust. It's, it's, um, it isn't quite as uh, winter tolerant, but if you can find the right place for it, um, it, it's nothing like a, a sluggish, it's much more delicate. And um, uh, Maurizio Usai, who has spoken to us, um, and uh, he has a cross between Azuraeum and the main fruitycans, which is a bit more robust. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, gorse, flowers right through the winter. What's not to like? Well, the storms are not to like, but. Um, if you've got wild boar in the garden like we have, it's actually quite useful. And this is Anisodontea, um, which is a South African shrub, very delicate, airy shrub that flowers right through winter with these lovely mallow um, flowers. And last but not least, uh, rosemary. There are so many rosemaries, but this particular one I'm just going to show you um, is coming to the end, but it's it's um, pink. This is Majorcan pink, 
because it has a lovely floppy um, soft form and um, so it, it's, it, it gives a different character to that part of the garden. I'm not going to go through them all but this is a, uh, a collection of berries and um, other types of um, greenery which we can have because I think I've used up all my time. Thank you Yvonne, that was lovely. Um, really great idea to see some nice, you know, some plants, even if they've been taken out of their garden, because we can't obviously go round on Zoom round your garden, particularly right now. Well, that's a challenge for, the, yes. for another speaker is to take us round. Now. <laughs> yes, no, I'm, I'm setting the pace here. Yeah, OK. Um, all right. So I'm going to put us all back onto gallery. So if you if you unshare now. Uh, OK, now you have unshared. Um, and I'll just uh, I'll kick off with some two questions, if I may, um, which was the Anasondendea, sorry, which is the cultivar, do you remember, of okay. the South African plant? Or shall I go on your website? Did you show us your website? Oh, I've forgotten to do this. I'm terribly yeah. sorry. Well, I, we I... Can, we'll spell it out. Let's let's spell it out for people, because if you it, explain. It, um, it, First of all, the, it was Anisodontea um, malvastroides. Okay, thank you. And, and, also can... the, and the honeysuckle, the winter honeysuckle? Fragrantissima. Okay. So if, if, if you go onto my website. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here it is, it's gardeninumbria.com. Now, don't, the, the, you may find one that's dot it, don't, don't, don't go for that. This is gardeninumbria.com. And if you look on plant of the month, you see here, that's where all the month, the, every month, uh, uh, the plants that I, when they're, they're uh, showing their most interesting features um, uh, are all listed there. Um, and I, I do continue to add to the site, so it's not, um, um, but the, the, the list of plants I've just maimed for you is, is here. Thank so you. Thank you. Right. Fantastic. Right, so let's see if anybody um, has any questions. Uh, if you go in your reactions, you put your hand up, you come to the front of my screen. Uh, I've got another one. Oh, there's Marcia. Hi, Marcia. Unmute yourself. On... Marcia, are you are you coming? Uh, okay, it's on the left, on the bottom left of your screen. You just see the little. Uh, speaker can you see mm. i've got one um gray water uh, while mm. sorting out okay uh gray water they're gray water systems have you got one of those gray water systems yvonne or are you just how does it work in your garden um well we're lucky to have water at all actually <laughs> we, we, would be, we, 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 we were cut off from the mains last last summer so um uh, I mean, with that in mind, I thought, well, you know, we, 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 the, the water supply was so precarious. I thought, well, I ought to, you know, take the washing up bowl outside and dump it over a plant. And I, I, it didn't seem to do any good. And I don't know where I'm going wrong, frankly. Um, OK, well, perhaps there's someone in the in the in the gallery or in the in the meeting that actually can help us with that. who has got experience of that. Um, uh, yes, uh, De Delia. Hi, yes. Delia. Hi. Um, Yvonne, we live a little bit further south than you, not very far. We're in the oh. hills above, or a bit further south of Spoleto. So we're 600 metres plus, and many of the things you say are very much what we experience. We keep daily records of temperatures, minimum, maximum, as well as water. The same pattern over the last five years, consistently, the total annual rainfall has dropped every year, consistently. 
but we have these long, long droughts. And like you were saying, uh, very, very little with, uh, rain in the winter, except for an incredible deluge in January, 2021, and then nothing. And then the same as you, beginning of 2022, 20, right through to September, we had more rain in, in 24 hours than we had like the rest of the year. We, one of the ways we, we can't use, uh, we don't use gray water as such, but we have a, a um, septic tank. So already everything from the house does go out and it's then down the hill on long snaky uh, kind of French drains. So it does provide, uh, the, the runoff all goes down the hill and it helps with the plants. What we did start doing, we don't take the washing up uh, water except for that, which is very clean that we've rinsed something in. That we found worked very well for pots. Um, but we also now live with a bucket in the shower and you just push it aside when you're putting soap on or shampoo. Oh. But the rest of the time, we actually every day, even in this, even now, we're doing it every day. We take it out. Luckily, um, <laughs> We've had a couple of days, a day of rain two days ago. And so it just gets tipped into the rainwater tank, the underground rainwater tank, when it isn't needed for any of the plants. But I found that that really helped quite a lot of things that had been really struggling. And we'd been struggling to keep them going. And, and like you said, we, we lost a lot of plants in the last two years during the very dry periods. We only have... Uh, water from a natural spring in the mountains, which is shared with a couple of houses. And that does tend to run out most years around August or so. But like you, we also were cut off from the mains water. We have, luckily now we do have a mains connection, but if they have any difficulty done on the plain or in the cities like Spoleto and so on, they just cut us off mm. almost instantly. And the only thing I found was that the only way I've managed to keep things going is to, to take a lot of cuttings using very similar, I'm not nearly as adventurous or as well, uh, I'm not as, um, as good a gardener as you are Yvonne, but I use much more of those, the same simple things, the local things. And I tend to, on walks in the mountains, sometimes get, um, for instance, there's a little white uh, flowering sepillo, uh, um, a wild thyme and there's a pink one as well the pink one does very well and once it is established it creates a carpet uh, and I'm now trying to do the same with the white one or other things like this, different types of um, cistus uh, I take cuttings from them and I find that having a sheltered spot where I can do cuttings in our own very poor if you like compost because it's it's all the um, dry leaves as well as all the, the paper and everything else mixed up. Um, and that works very well with cuttings. And so I tend to do this thing of just sticking cuttings in, particularly in, in sheltered spots. Uh, and you, it means you have to be very patient because you lose quite a lot, but there's always something that you can replace, something that doesn't make it during the, the dry um, summers. And, and like you last year, I mean, we had, we had temperatures in the 30s, day and night from, uh, I think, the end of April onwards, and then into the 40s. It was, everything looked half dead. But I have been surprised by what suddenly does reappear. Um, things I thought were completely dead, but I just haven't bothered to dig them up. I just left them. And now they're suddenly beginning to show signs of life again. Um, and the other thing, that, but because of the heat that we've had or the warm winter, uh, we've also got now flowering wild brew, which normally doesn't flower until May. Mm. I had and a that's a real problem because also the apple trees are flowering, are beginning to flower now and they shouldn't be flowering until April, May. So is there anyone in the gallery that who, who knows, do, do, what, what is, have we read, what is going to happen with plants? I guess they're going to adapt. Uh, you know, that you, you know, we saw the uh, banks here that is flowering in November instead of March or um, April. Um, anybody can speak to that in the platea? 
you know, that has anybody uh, read anything about the adaption? Well, it, it's happening on too fast a scale or too mm -hmm. fast a timeline for plants to adapt. That's just plants adapt over a very, very, very long time. It happens very slowly. So they won't, we can't expect them to adapt. Some may, but that's not a reasonable expectation. Okay. It's more likely that we're going to be working with different plant palettes, um, ones that are from more, at least I'm in Southern California, we're looking to Baja at that plant palette because essentially everything will move north somewhat, mm -hmm. right? from the, the equator north, I'm sure from the equator on the Southern hemisphere, the, the opposite direction. But um, the plant palettes are going to have to change. So we need to be looking around at the next drier regions to see how those are doing and then starting to plant our gardens that way. I know there's a lot of research going into that. I wanted to just also add some comments on the gray water question. Gray water, there's a couple of things you might try. Change your soaps because not all, if there's a lot of detergent in the soaps that you use, that can be a problem. There are special ones that are designed to be used with gray water systems. And not all plants will be happy with gray water. Some will, some won't. A lot of the Australians and South Africans, uh, plants in the protea family struggle with gray water. I don't know about many of the Mediterranean specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised it's trial and error. A couple of other points, you don't really want to hold your gray water because it's got bacteria in it by definition. And so you don't want to put it in a tank and hold it. You want to use it right away. You also, if you can, you might want to dilute it um, because if there are you know, materials in there that are toxic to your plants by diluting it might help. You don't want to use water that's got disinfectant or salts or boron or you know anything like that. Uh, let me just think for a second. And don't use it on vegetables, trees, and you know ornamentals. It seems to me, in my experience, it works best with fruit trees. You know, you don't want to splash on anything that might go into your mouth because of the bacteria that would be in that water that could be on the plant. So, like lettuce, tomatoes, all those kinds of things, you don't want to use it on. Citrus, it, it works really well. Figs, pomegranate, pineapple, guava. Um, I've used it on a ton of different kinds of fruit trees. Ornamentals, again, you have, it's, a, it's a trial and error situation. And you're never putting out that much water really that it can, can replace an irrigation system. It's just a supplement. You, know, you have to have the right expectation. It's a supplement. Uh, can I just say that uh, we found it worked very well on Pitosporum uh, that were in vases, uh, the, the nano ones. But then we, we do use, we use very little, we almost use no soap at all. We use as minimal detergent and only those that can be used in sort of recycled water. And we found that the forum <clears throat> really thrived on it. Um, and so did the pineapple guava. Uh, if I could add a little bit, um, the um, Nan made some good points about um, how plants may or may not adapt. Um, and there is a lot of research going on. We have a lot of hubris in thinking that we understand everything. Um, and the plants just don't care a lot of the time. They go about their business, they, they do their stuff. And we often don't know a lot about them until we have these very stressful situations happening. So you should be very observant of what's working, what's not, what's changing, what's not. You know, um, Yvonne was talking about the roses blooming, you know, at, off times. I mean, that's something we all notice in Mediterranean climates. Um, you know, the plants, <laughs> they don't care what they're supposed to do. They just <laughs> do, do what they can. And we can learn what local situation is. Um, we just moved house and we're in a very different part of the Bay Area. I thought I knew this area quite well. I've been consulting for 45 years. Um, I'm, I'm finding all kinds of surprises about the, the climate, the local climate right here, um, how hot, how cold it gets, the wind, the exposure, the soils. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I, I feel like a newbie starting over again. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. So 
And uh, some of the things that I've been trying, um, you know, work really well and others not at all. So, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, and so be bold, try things and um, observe what's going on um, in this, you know, natural world that you're trying to harness. Um, Thank you, Sean. Uh, okay, Marcia, are you with us now? Yes. Yeah, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Zoom put something all over my screen that I'd never seen before and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. Um, I just want to say something positive about Tucrium. I know you said people said, oh, Tucrium, and then you did go on to say Tucrium fruticum azuratum is a good one, possibly, and they're getting a better one. I'm in Southern California outside of Los Angeles in an area called Rolling Hills, um, kind of high up, maybe only 600, 800 feet. But I have the most gorgeous Tucrium fruticum azuratum blooming all over the place on my property right now. And very, very easy. It's one of my easiest plants. And it's a beautiful sapphire blue. I want to say that positive point. Also, I'm interested to hear more about success people have had with bulbs. I've had not such good luck with a lot, but excellent luck with um, Scylla Peruviana, which is a beautiful, beautiful purple. And it just requires nothing, of course. And um, I ne never do anything to it in the summer. It just disappears. And now it's coming back again. And um, anyway, I just wanted to suggest that for people to try if they're interested. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Liz, hi, you need to unmute. Liz, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Oh. Down at the bottom left corner. I'll do it. I, I, I can't do it for you. Oh, maybe I can. Hang on. Um, okay, I can't. Let's just see. Liz. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, no, it won't let me do it. Sorry, Liz, you need to do it yourself. You need to unmute. <laughs> that's a rare, that's a rare problem. Done it. Done okay. it. Well done, well done. Well done. Well done. The My uh, tucrum is still growing very, very tall and very full of flowers. And I've just had a big prune because it's getting out of hand. And I don't know, I wanted to ask Yvonne's advice about pruning because she did show a list, but it went, came and went so fast that I didn't have time to read it. And I really, plants are sort of flowering now when normally they should be resting because it's such a strange year, nothing is normal. And um, so I don't know whether to, for, for example, cystus, do I prune it or just let it go wild? Um, and then another thing I wanted to say was that the really big expert on recycling grey water and every sort of water is King Charles at Highgrove. He recycles everything. Um, so maybe we should ask his advice. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like advice about pruning. To do, to do or not to do. Um, I, I, if, if something's happily flowering, I wouldn't touch it. I mean, I mean, I can't think of anything worse. The, 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 I've actually seen the, the council going around with a little truck and the, a, a stepladder um, pruning flowering cherries in the high street in bloom. You don't prune cherries. <laughs> well, I, 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 these people seem to think they were doing God's work, and I, I, I was just absolutely horrified. But no, I mean, you, just, you need to think about. I mean, I know it's a funny year and all that, but tucriums do flower in winter. They do. Sisters, sisters, for example, they're not flowering, but no, they look but you, wild. Did I prove? If, if sisters are going to flower in May, say, or maybe late April, if you cut all their um, shoots off now, then they're not going to flower for you. Ah. So what you need to do is let them have their little flower and then have a look, see if they need a trim. At the end don't of go mad. I mean, you should imagine, well, Olivia Philippi says that you should imagine that you are a goat. Mm. And, and you go around and you oh. just nibble <laughs> at the plant and shape it that way. Not just hack it right back, unless you're a really vindictive, because no, you're very hungry. But you know. sort of these big pool, 
mm. um, which um, do grow very nicely afterwards, but my garden is pretty wild. Um, and um, it's uh, very strange that the variation in climate, because I'm very close to um, Yvonne, just across the other side of the lake and the climate is totally different yes. and she yes. said that she didn't have any olives this year and I had the best crop I ever had in 35 years I had mm. wonderful olives so I mean it's this is one of the most exciting things about garden that's thank why you. it's thank you Yvonne. that's why it's so that's why it's so um, important to observe, you know, what's happening in your local, your own little patch of earth. I mean, it can vary so considerably. Here where I am in California, you just go a short distance and it's a totally different um, expression of the climate, um, just over the hill or down to the bay or whatever. The plants can often, if you really pay attention to them, you can kind of get a sense of when they need to be pruned or not. In general, if you're sliding into summer and plants want to rest, you know, you don't want to be pruning them right away because that might cause them to grow and things like that. Um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll kind of see most years when the flowering happens. And so you want to prune well before that, you know, if you need to. Um, and you know the the state of the individual plant may or may not need pruning that year or whatever. So if you just you just need to get to learn, don't go by the you know the city's you know council's calendar of pruning um, cherry trees. I mean on this date, um, you know you have to really observe what's going on this year in your garden, and it you know you just kind of get in tune with it all. Um, it's it's and that it really you it becomes really interesting just to, to see all these things happening in the micro level in in your garden so yeah thank you sean i think that was a great message from you uh, yvonne to go out enjoy what's now um you know gardening is supposed to be a de-stressor not a stressor um that isn't always the case for me, but I, I really appreciated, and I, I think we all appreciated you sharing your experience and your beautiful blooms, and also the invite to join you on your website for um, detailed plant lists. And um, I will, I have received a, a plant list from last uh, month's speaker, which I will be sending out they actually went and did that work over the holidays. So that was good news. And I will also be sending that to you, to everyone who participated in the um, December Zoom. So uh, if we may, um, we will leave, we'll love and leave ourselves and with a big thanks and round of applause to Yvonne. Thank you so much. Well done. Fantastic. So see you all next um, month. Uh, what are we going next month? Oh, we're going to go back to the James Passon um, project with the maintenance manager, Caroline Bourdillon. So we're going to the south of France and she's going to talk about how that project has established or is establishing itself. So I think that will be very interesting, fascinating. Thank you all for being here. Good Thank evening. You Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.